and see if that starts screwing things up. Um, so now I know what to look at, so uh, hopefully this time around um, we're going to get things right. Um, so today we're going to talk about navigation, and uh, before we get into that, I have the same two slides that I had from last time in case, uh, in case you know, we got a different viewer today. Um, who's this? This is me. Um, uh, I'm going to use the whiteboard right here. Uh, I've got, I'm going to Google some, some things. Uh, I probably should have already Googled them. I've got these slides and I'm really just going to talk a lot. Um, do some, do some math on this whiteboard here. Um, so navigation is what I was what I do in my job. Um, this is just for posterity to show that I, I, I do that. So navigation um, means OD orbit determination. Um, so we see here I've done the orbit determination analysis for the multi-scale magnetospheric uh, survey mission, uh, Tedris missions, lunar reconnaissance orbiter, Hubble, uh, Aqua Era, Aqua Aura Terra Trim. We call it the A train. Um, so we've, I've done a lot of uh, navigation operations um, as well as analysis. Uh, currently, I do analysis for uh, uh, orbital determination in the NRHO. And we can get to that into in just a little bit. So what is navigation? Navigation is the science and quote unquote art of estimating where you are and where you're going. Um, it is, uh, we can, if you're kind of reading ahead, uh, you can see things like uh, your, the GPS in your phone, a self-driving car, robot vacuum, uh, things of that nature. Um, navigation is the uh, art and science of, tell, of that thing, figuring out where it is and where it's going. Um, not only where it is, where it's going, but probably maybe even other things about itself um, that can uh, help it do its job. Um, and so navigation is part of the guidance, navigation, and control uh, problem or uh, ish, I guess you can call it the problem. So I'm going to switch over to this view and we're going to do a little, see, we got guidance, navigation, and control. And so guidance is telling you, I guess, abstractly how to get to where you want to go, starting from here, starting from up someplace. Um, I'm going to zoom this in if I can, manual zoom in. Um, navigation, what we're going to talk about today is figuring out where you are. So for that, I'm going to draw a dot with a circle around it. So that's trying to figure out where you are. Uh, control is the actual, uh, at a uh, more granular, granular level, at the system, subsystem level, uh, the control, actual control of the actuators and stuff. So I'm going to draw an actual robot arm here, a robot arm. So the control control laws, uh, control theory, uh, it deals with uh, these kinds of control laws. Guidance takes where you are, which is guided by navigation, and tells you where you want to go. So guidance tells control Guidance tells control um, your optimum path, you know, how to get from A to B in the best way possible. Um, guidance would be, uh, for example, uh, reading the map to you. Uh, guidance, navigation, tells guidance and control where, where it thinks you are. And then, of course, control. Uh, control basically controls it. Controls. Uh, control actually is what manipulates your environment, and then by manipulating your environment, it then puts impact on what, where you are, and from where you are, what is the best way to get where you're going. So uh, navigation, guidance, navigation, and control are all kind of uh, uh, enveloped. They're all kind of work together. They're grouped together um, or organizationally, um, although they're all pretty. They are all pretty different. Um, and, and what you do to handle them. Um, control law, uh, control law theory is where you have your uh, things that you may have heard of like PID control, um, proportional integrative and derivative control, um, where you take you know, your error, where you want your arm to be minus where your arm actually is, and using that error 
uh, determine how hard you want to move the arm to where you want it to go. And so that's a very physical process. And so um, smart PID controllers can do the things like uh, keep a uh, building from falling down with a, with a mass damper. Uh, that's, a, that's an example of a PID controller. Uh, guidance uh, deals with a lot of like optimal math theory where you're, um, you take where you are, where I say where you are, I don't just mean like where you are on the planet, but uh, what your whole state is um, and where, you, where you're going or what you want to be um, and, and tells you optimally how to get there. Not just where you are, where you're going, but what direction you're pointed in, um, you know, what is your configuration in, in doing these things. Um, that, that's the guidance program. And then navigation, what we're going to talk about is um, how do you find out where you are? And uh, you can kind of get, uh, a, a, you get a, a cheat right here, because um, I've already told you what the parts of a navigation system are uh, right here on the slide. Um, computer, um, I guess, you know, technically you don't really need a computer. Um, you know, there, a lot of people like to talk about how you do navigation in your brain all the time. Um, you sensors, I mean, you can use your own, we can talk about our own selves then, right? So sensors would be our eyes, ears, sen uh, 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 sense of touch, and, and such. Uh, the environment itself that in which you are taking these measurements or using these sensors are, of course, a part of this whole problem. And then I, I wrote hopes and dreams, and that, that goes into the, uh, that, the earlier parentheses in art, um, the hopes and dreams of um, whoever's designing this thing, that it works. Um, so basically just um, uh, your sensors, your computer, and uh, the environment, and then the effort to put the thing together. Um, so the navigation problem itself is uh, one of uh, a, a statistical problem. Um, so um, I'm gonna cheat, cheat right now. We're gonna get into it deeper later, uh, but it's, it's a very statistical problem where you don't know where you are, so you take uh, uncertain measurements that only tell you partially where you could be and so you have to synthesize those two um, those two sets of knowledge in order to create a uh, updated uh, set of knowledge which would be your your new estimated uh, state your new estimated uh, navigation state we would call and so um, it's statistics and it's a lot of uh, linear algebra and um, that is because um, like I said uh, your your measurements, your, you, you have a multi-variable state, um, you know, you have three three elements of position, three elements of velocity, time, um, and then anything else you're trying to estimate that you think you can that would be of interest. Um, whenever you take a measurement, any kind of measurement, it may not give you an update to every single element of that state. Uh, so. Uh, you have correlations into um, if I'm somewhere in space and I take a range measurement from a certain direction, that has correlations in that direction uh, more in line with some Cartesian directions than others. Um, so you can get you know higher, as you would imagine, you can get better resolution of where you think you are in the direction of your range measurement. So it's, it's a statistical problem in that nothing is certain in the navigation problem, everything's going to be wrapped in statistics. You're, you'll see how that there's going to be noise everywhere. Um, there's also going to be linear algebra. We're going to be we're going to be dealing with matrices, uh, multi matrix multiplication, inversions, and addition. And um, there's going to be I guess you could say there's a little bit of uh, calculus going on in there, um, but we're going to breeze right over it. Okay, that was slide one, and we're 15 minutes in. 10 minutes because I started five minutes late. Mm. All right. Navigation in space. These are, we got to talk about space, right? Um, so I'm not going to get, I can, uh, I guess at this point I can go two ways. I could talk about uh, fundamentals of state estimation. That's, we're going to get into that. That's going to be actually showing some math and such. Um, showing into showing the equations, um, or I can talk about uh, just navigation in space. Uh, you know, story time. Um, what is navigation in space, and so on. Um, I'm going to, to flip a mental coin and go with this. I'm re we're going to talk about navigation in space first. 
So uh, I was talking about the navigation uh, problem earlier. Uh, so we're going to talk about specifically navigation in space. And so what do you mean by what is navigation in space? Um, obviously, it's, it's figuring out where your spacecraft is and such. But so who's figuring that out? Is it people on the ground or is it the, the spacecraft itself? And so that, that's the first bullet we have here, ground navigation or onboard navigation. Um, typically, uh, when we're talking about space stuff, um, surprisingly, we talk about ground navigation um, because there is some onboard automation going on, um, depending, on depending on the mission um, or constellation of missions. Um, you usually have people on the ground uh, running the navigation problem. Uh, you probably also have an onboard navigation solution um, and automation to varying degrees uh, depending on what your uh, what your mission is um, for things like low earth crude space um, we we actually kind of evolved through um, strictly well I guess there's yeah it, it, the problem is split both who commands which directions does do commands flow who holds I guess the the command banana um, who gets to say who controls the spacecraft? Um, and of course, what are the implications with the data flows in terms of do you have to, um, are you doing measurements on the ground, uh, taking measurements of a spacecraft and then having to send that uh, measurement up to the spacecraft to process or are you crossing it on the ground and then uploading a state at a later time? Um, can the spacecraft take measurements directly as, as in, uh, as in does it have any kind of remote sensing. Um, and so that, that kind of gets into the uh, next uh, bullet here, ground-based radiometric tracking. So what we're gonna, what we kind of get into here are uh, increasing levels of complexity uh, of, or, or sophistication when it comes to uh, navigation in space. So uh, the ground-based ground radiometric tracking is uh, fancy talk for using a big antenna now I'm going to draw an, a, a nice antenna here, and there's its receiver, uh, a, a, an antenna pointer at your spacecraft up here, and so uh, ground-based radiometric tracking is what you imagine it would be. So it, it, in some ways, there there are actually multiple ways you can you can cut this. Um, there is uh, radar tracking. And that's the way we track uh, debris or any kind of what we call non-cooperative uh, satellites. And so that is basically uh, bouncing your your radar off the off the skin of your uh, target back to your back to your uh, back to your radar dish. You can't really see green, can you? Anyway. Um, I'm gonna have to stick to black, aren't I? So basically you're bouncing the radar off the skin. That's your classic radar, just use it in space. Um, it has limited, limited value. Um, you're, you can track things non-cooperatively. Um, because it's kind of skin tracking, the, the signal coming back is uh, of course not really controlled and, and degrades um, because it kind of bounces in, in any direction. Um, so going up the ladder, Here's our antenna again. Here's our spacecraft again. Uh, our, now our spacecraft, we, we can actually, it's, what, it's cooperating with us. Uh, it's cooperating with us and we can take uh, tracking data with it by having it point an antenna back at us and we can talk to it, send it a signal. It can take that signal. I'm gonna zoom in right here this is my zoom in of the satellite over here. That signal is going to come in, come into the antenna. Here's my signal. It's going to go through the transponder. I'm going to call that T for transponder. And then it's just going to come right back. Maybe uh, maybe something's changed in it. Maybe some maybe it just takes the very same signal and sends it right back. Um, in a lot of our tracking situations. Uh, I'm just going to put an arrow here, arrow here. So we kind of call that bent pipe. You know, it takes the signal, uh, throws it through its transponder, and then throws it back at you. 
at a slightly different uh, frequency. So you got your frequency in and your frequency return. Um, and so I, uh, uh, you got, so this guy's blasting it out at frequency in, and he's going to get it back, a signal at frequency return. And so you're sending at one signal, you're returning at a slightly different signal. Um, and you, you get that signal, you know you can estimate what your transponder uh, delay is, and we can call that transponder bias. That just kind of shows up as a range bias. Um, you can estimate that. So earlier I said, you know, you've got your position and velocity in space. Uh, you've also got other parameters that you can try to estimate, and this is one of them, your transponder delay. That's usually one of uh, a a thing to estimate um, if you're trying to, to solve it for a particular problem. And of course, every transponder is different. It has, and of course it changes over time with thermal issues as it's just a, 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 fatter, a matter of electrons bouncing through equipment. So with this, we call this coherent tracking and meaning that it's coherent, like you're, you're speaking and it's speaking to you and you understand each other coherently. Um, Otherwise, you can call it incoherent tracking, either skin tracking or um, you've received uh, data that is, is garbled in, in some way. Um, with coherent tracking, uh, you can do range and range rate. And so we talked about range earlier, and range rate is basically range is the velocity of the spacecraft in the direction of the range. So we call that just range rate. Um, that that gets you a ground-based radiometric tracking. Oh, I guess I failed to mention, um, if you're tracking coherently, um, you can do fancy, uh, uh, I guess, you can either kind of treat your angles, uh, antenna angles as a measurement themselves to get the, the, the measurement, you know, what direction am I pointing in space, um, or you can do fancy uh, uh, signal processing to determine, you know, which direction was the signal the strongest. Um, but angle, angle measurements are of uh, not, not high uh, value um, when there's a, a lot of parallax when you go into space, meaning, um, uh, meaning there's a lot, you're, you're looking several, several kilometers and, and tiny changes in, in your angle can screw up your, uh, there's a lot of noise on, on angle measurements. Um, so I list here um, internal sensors. And we're not going to go too deep into this because mostly that's just not what I, I work with. Um, so um, as you can expect, uh, spacecraft can come with any kind of internal sensor. Um, some of the, some of the uh, famous ones are accelerometer. Um, accelerometers are in kind of every, uh, every kind of consumable, to, or not even consumable, but every kind of product today. Your phone has a few of these. Uh, your phone probably also has a magnetometer. Um, um, lots of lots of things have a magnetometer. That's useful for going around the Earth, uh, kind of telling you where you are, but mostly telling you what direction you're pointed. Um, same thing with a sun sensor and star camera. Uh, these guys like to tell you what direction you're pointed, uh, more so than, than where you are or where you're going. Um, we can get into attitude determination uh, very briefly. It, it is just a, kind of a straight extension from uh, position and velocity, a uh, three degrees of freedom uh, navigation problem. Um, all right, navigation in space. Uh, here's some. Uh, here's something that's fun. Uh, GPS in space. So you know you've got GPS on your phone, but you we also have GPS in space. Would you look at that? And um, we're also talking about doing GPS at the moon. And I don't mean. GPS, like setting up a GPS constellation at the moon, but using the GPS we have, um, it, it, the signals that don't hit the Earth spill around the Earth and, and go all the way to the moon. And I can go into that very briefly. But um, the GPS problem, very briefly, is uh, is one of uh, a geometry and also uh, a system. Uh, it's a linear algebra equation. So um, what you're trying to solve with GPS, uh, because you're not coherent in any way, is you use this constellation that uh, is also open, that is just uh, sending out a signal. Uh, all the, all the uh, GPS satellites send out a signal, 
uh, you receive these signals and with if you receive uh, enough signals with good enough geometry, you can get very high quality uh, uh, position and velocity estimate of where you are, position, excuse me. So the way that works is, um, you know, where you are and uh, I'm trying to remember exactly the direction to go with this. So where you are, when you send it, when you send a signal, um, there's going to be all kinds of issues. If you send a signal um, from a satellite that itself is moving very fast, uh, I guess, you know, what, what the big issue with uh, GPS, the GPS problem is, is, is um, relativistic issues where these guys, these clocks all don't really stay the same. So time uh, becomes, a, becomes itself a, a variable in, in this issue. So um, you got your satellite that is signal, sending a signal to you, you're right here, and you've got a position in space, X, Y, Z. It's in, it, uh, you're receiving a signal from this guy uh, and it's telling you it's time. And same thing with this guy. He's going another direction at a different speed. He's telling you his time. So he's telling you his time and his ephemeris. And ephemeris is a fancy word for uh, where it's going. And so when you have, if you have the uh, position of, if you have the position of these satellites multiple satellites uh, and uh, their times, you have four unknowns, you know, your own position, and uh, if you get four satellites, now you got four inputs. Isn't that neat? And uh, the more geometrically diverse they are, uh, the, the better kind of solution you can get. And of course, the more, um, the more satellites you can throw into the mix, then your problem becomes what they call over, uh, Overconditioned or, or oversolved, and um, then it it just helps your uh, helps your estimate even further. All right, so the next thing to talk about that was a I probably butchered that a little bit. I don't do GPS too much, so um, the next thing to talk about is optical navigation, and uh, optical navigation uh, gets into uh, computer vision, and uh, what I want to limit this kind of talk to right here. Um, for optical navigation is, is how we look into it. So one second. So optical navigation is this. You've got a picture of the moon, or you, sorry, you've got your actual moon, and your moon has some craters on it. And I'm gonna draw a little shadow here. So there's your, there's your moon. How's that look? That's a pretty good moon. All right. Um, you're over here with your eyeball looking at the moon. And so it creates an image of the moon. Right here. And so uh, computer vision, optical, uh, optical navigation uh, can take this image. I'm going to draw my fun little image here. Take this image and from there you can get things by measuring uh, it's the, it's the width of the entire app, the, the width of the entire person here. Uh, you can measure uh, the actual locations. Yeah, you know, I'll also put height here. Why not? So you can, you can measure the actual size of this guy um, and get an estimate for range. That's fun. Uh, you can look at, uh, you can compare your locations of uh, craters uh, against a map and uh, use that to get some angles um, for kind of where you are in relation to the moon. Um, that's neat. And so something that I've, I've been able to do, what this ultimately becomes uh, in the navigation problem are, are uh, angle measurements or range measurements from your features or from uh, if, if you're doing a gross uh, measurement of the entire moon, you could say from the center of the moon, a range or an angle measurement. Um, and but of course it's kind of taken in reverse insofar as you don't have a ground site here shooting a signal, you know, into your eye. Uh, it, it's the other way around. You're you're creating the angles and ranges by looking at an image and doing some uh, math on the pixels and some prior knowledge of the size of the moon.
so that's that. And then the last thing I want to talk about is XNAV, and that's called that's just short for X-ray X-ray navigation, I, I think. Uh, well, um, this one is really crazy. This is uh, this is using uh, relativistic effects of uh, of pulsars to give you an estimate of where you are and where you're going. So looking at so effectively taking that GPS problem and um, expanding it to uh, at pulsars. And um, while, while GPS uh, satellites uh, are, are whizzing over you and, and blasting out a signal, a known signal, telling you where they are, where they're going, and what time they, they have so that you can figure out where you are and what, what your time is, um, pulsars for all intents and purposes are out there in fixed in inertial space um, you know because they're many light years many many light years away um, and they uh, some of these x-ray pulsars um, create have highly repeatable signals that uh, are you know millisecond within have millisecond uh, frequencies or, or wavelengths and so um, the same same issue there and I'm just you know I can just draw for fun you have the pulsars in, in different areas around your, uh, you know, your, our entire solar system is down here. And so you've got pulsars in different directions sending you uh, different signals. Sometimes it's, it's a very uh, normal signal. Uh, sometimes it's got like a weird hump in it. But they're very normal and, and uh, we've cataloged these guys. We've cataloged these guys, right? So I'm trying to make some random signals. Uh, you, we catalog these signals, we understand these signals, and so you take that signal, and now I'm gonna take all this and zoom way in. You can, and, and say you're, you're, you're flying along in your spacecraft, and uh, you, know, uh, what, you, know, you, you know the signals that you expect, and um, it's coming in. It, your, the signal's coming into your spacecraft right here, um, right here, right? However, your simulation, you thought it was going to be right here, right? And so there is a delta, there is an error between your catalogs, your known signal, and when you're actually receiving it. And so this, this, that difference here means you're not actually where you thought you were, you're, you're actually back here, you're somewhere else. Um, and of course, the, the uh, sensitivity uh, to this is in the, direction of the, uh, in the direction of the pulsar. So you get four, three, four pulsars in different directions to cover your geometric Cartesian space, and you can actually get pretty good uh, pretty good space, you know, space navigation estimates uh, by just looking at pulsars, and so that that's pretty hot. Um, we, there's a X nav, you can Google that. Um, they're working on that right now. Um, I don't know. I think one's maybe on the space station, and we're talking. You know, it's going to ultimately be the way that we have to do navigation without talking to the Earth. Um, I, I think you've noticed. Everything that I've, aside from the internal sensors, everything I've said here uh, requires the Earth in some fashion, right? You got your ground-based radiometric tracking, um, uh, 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 the GPS, um, and then um, you got your internal sensors, which don't, well, the magnetometer requires the Earth, um, but the, your star camera and uh, things like XNAV and optical navigation uh, will get us, you know, far beyond Earth so far that we can forget it. Or at least don't require it. Um, you know, you tell them what you tell them what you're doing, and, and not ask them to tell you where you are, and that's that's nice. Okay, so now we're going to get into the boring part. Uh, so I kind of um, hinted at it earlier. Um, how are we doing? Fine. Uh, so I kind of hinted at it earlier that uh, there's going to be some uh, statistics stuff and some linear algebra stuff. So I'm going to pull something up. Um, in the meantime, and you're just going to have to wait for me. Um, 
So while I'm pulling that up, I can talk about this a little bit. So uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, nothing is known perfectly or can be measured perfectly. That's, that's just the statistics side of the estimation problem. Um, one second. And, uh, and then I also mentioned earlier linear algebra stuff. Um, so, you know, we're, we're in a multi-state, multi-variable state space, um, and we're taking measurements that only partially reveal um, our state within that space. Um, and, of course, the, the, the direction or, you know, the, the, the state space affected kind of has components in maybe all your, uh, all your state space variables, but um, doesn't solve everything at once. Um, GPS does a pretty good job at getting pretty close at getting all of your uh, position, uh, getting your position, you know, all, all in one go, uh, requiring the four satellites um, and things like that. But good clock comes in and then you're in receiver and some transient action. Okay, so I cheated um, and uh, I just looked up something on Wikipedia. I wanted to find the, the uh, I wanted to find the equations without uh, without really doing it myself. So th this is uh, th this is a full this is a full disclaimer. Um, th what we're looking at right here is some math. I'm going to go over this math a little bit. Um, it looks a little daunting, but that's just because it's kind of um, made almost. I, I want to say cynically made to look daunting. Um, it, it, it's remarkably intuitive if you kind of look at this step by step and you understand and you look at which each of these are. And so what we're looking at right now is the uh, are the equations of the extended Kalman filter. Um, one second, let me just make sure. We're, I want to look at the discrete continuous. Okay, yeah, this is the one I want. So I'm going to switch to the. Hold on, let's switch to this view. Okay, so um, let me go back to the slide real quick and just make sure. Um, I'm just going to skip actually squares estimation, and we're going to go right into the extended Kalman filter because that, that's what we use, or at least that is kind of the, the baseline of what a lot of uh, navigation is done on. Um, there are a lot of people, I want to say a lot of people, uh, the actually squares estimation um, exists, and uh, in one sentence, it, it's um, it's putting all of your measurements into a big bucket, um, taking taking your initial estimate and and putting them together, turning the crank, and um, and coming up with a new estimate at the same time, or at you know a, a different time within your data span, um, so that it re reduces the total uh, root mean square error between you know your state across all those times and all your measurements. And so it's done in a batch. That's why they call it batch, as in like all the measurements are dumped in together. Uh, the crank is turned one big time and um, you get a new state estimate and then you turn it again. And uh, these are called iterations where um, you're, you're iteratively reducing the root mean square by kind of stepping your estimate uh, closer and closer um, to, to, I guess, a, an optimal solution that, reduce, that minimizes your root mean square of, of all your measurements in that bucket. Um, the extended Kalman filter is different. Uh, I, I, like I said, the, the, the earlier one is a batch. Um, the filter is um, taking measurements as they roll in uh, and then updating your state, as, state estimate and, you know, as you process the measurements. And so um, I'm gonna draw some pictures for that. But I'm going to go back to the, the, um, the equations here. So let's just kind of label these guys. So we're going to start off with um, what we have here. Can I highlight this stuff? Yes. That doesn't help, though. That makes it hard to read. So this, what I would call, what I'm going to read out is uh, x dot of t equals f of x plus W of T, where W of T, uh, it can be modeled as a normal distribution uh, with a zero norm and a spectral density modeled by this Q of T. Um, 
All this means is that um, we live in a society. This just means that we our, our, uh, our state moves forward in time as a function of where it is now, what you're doing to it, and some unknown process. We call this process noise. And so the process noise has this, has this uh, it is a random variable. And so we call this process noise and the process noise uh, has, you know, um, for each channel, a specific uh, probability density function. And if you take all those probability density functions and mash them together, you get the spectral, what they call the spectral density matrix. And so all this basically, all this first equation says is, uh, you know, um, our, our, your state is a function of where it is, what you're doing to it, and um, some unknown stuff, some stuff's happening to it. And the way you are looking at that state is by taking measurements um, who can be modeled as a model, who, I'm sorry, excuse me, the measurement is a model of the state plus some noise itself, and the noise itself can be modeled with uh, measurement noise itself, a Gaussian, uh, a Gaussian noise with uh, with density uh, r. Um, so these sub these sub I guess these subscripts k is just denote time k. So you know we're moving forward in time. When we're at time k, you're gonna you're gonna see things at like t naught. That's where you start. Time k where you are. T k minus one where you just were and time k plus one where you are going. And so the, uh, the state estimate problem starts with uh, your, you initialize it with your initial state estimate. So this is your, uh, the, the carrot hat just means estimate. So what that means is your expected state at, uh, at time zero is your estimated state at time zero with knowledge at time zero. So uh, of time zero, this is the zero bar zero means um, uh, the, the time at the time with the knowledge of. So this next, and this is where we get into a, a I guess a, a important term, uh, the covariance, the initial covariance. This uh, p matrix, um, if you look at it, this is a fancy uh, statistics um, thing where you're taking your your error your um, state minus your estimated state at, t at a certain time, uh, transposing it, uh, multiplying it by itself, and the expected value of that would be uh, the, I guess, the expected uncertainty of your initial state. And we call that uncertainty, uh, with some other information, the, the covariance. And so uh, the covariance is a, is a matrix, and so it's a, it's a special kind of matrix called a, a symmetric, where um, you have numbers on the diagonal, uh, and the numbers, I'm sorry, it's more than that. It's symmetric and it's positive semi-definite. And so that means lots of different things. Um, but it just basically means matrices can be thought of as rotations. Um, they can also be in the, in the covariance sense, can be thought of as kind of a, 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 a definition of an ellipsoid, so to speak. And so that ellipsoid, um, how big it is, what, what, which directions its um, axes are, and then um, kind of how skewed, how skewed and pressed and twisted is it within, uh, you know, it's uh, within its state space. Um, and so that gives you the different correlations of that ellipsoid. And of course, when I say ellipsoid, um, I'm thinking of three dimensions, but we're going to be, we can't get more than that. So we kind of think of this as a hyper ellipsoid if you want to get really fancy. So um, basically we have kind of do things in parallel. And so at this point, I'm going to switch over and start drawing things. And so um, you have where you actually are and where you're going. And so this is what we call the truth. And it's going along and it's doing its thing. But you don't know where you are. You have your estimate and it's right here. And you can tell it's wrong. So we call that your X hat, right? This is your truth, X. And so 
your estimated, your estimated guy follows the same function that your truth does. And we're going to call that F. This is what defines how it goes. Uh, for for uh, space, this means your uh, numerical integrator that, that whips you around the orbit, that keeps you in space. And so um, you'll see this F show up both. The F then works on your estimated states um, right here, if I can highlight it. So if you want to get from uh, time k, from, if you want to do time k from k minus 1, you're just going to uh, execute this function uh, with your estimated state uh, from uh, x hat, your estimated state at t time k minus 1 with the knowledge of k minus 1. And so that's your estimated state. That's the guy that gets put into um, your, your force function. Um, that also, down here, um, in addition, moving along with your uh, estimate, your estimate is your covariance that you have to predict or propagate. Um, and so what that means is um, your uh, estimate right here, this green dude, uh, there's an ellipse around him. Of, we call this kind of, the, that's the covariance ellipse. And it's got, it's got, it's, got, it's defined by, um, you know, it's, it's axes. A, B, we're going to say C comes out at you. And those would be the actual diagonal of your covariance matrix, right? And then so what defines, what defines then things like this angle that kind of, that rotates this whole guy from your perfect Cartesian so where A and B now have correlations in this, you know, assuming my board is a perfect Cartesian X and Y, uh, you, you see this ellipse is turned. And so these angles, not the angles themselves, but these correlations are a go in the uh, upper and lower diagonals, and it's moving together. And so there's your there's your uh, covariance, and it goes through itself a uh, propagation of a more convoluted propagation um, that involves uh, the state transition matrix. Um, that would be I'm sorry, uh, a Jacobian of your uh, f of your function. And so what the Jacobian is is taking your uh, function, right? You, you know, I mentioned earlier, we're numerically integrating uh, our spacecraft around the Earth, and now we have to uh, take the derivative, partial derivative of that function with respect to all of the um, states that we're trying to estimate. So X, Y, Z, uh, VX, VY, VZ, that creates this big F matrix, and this big capital F matrix we call the Jacobian. And so um, you take your Jacobian and then this, this uh, equation here, P dot equals FP plus PF transpose. Um, that is, uh, that's basically just, that's linear algebra um, that pushes your uh, P dot forward. And then this QT, remember that QT from earlier, uh, the QT is the spectral density matrix for your process noise. So this is where process noise is now fed into the the the, uh, the covariance of or base fed into the covariance of your estimate, um, and so you're solving these equations um, to get you from to propagate yourself from uh, t k minus one to t k. So we're calling this t k right here, over here, right? So as we propagate or predict from tk to tk minus 1, our covariance here, well, first we kind of propagate our, our or not or first or simultaneously, whatever, we're moving our, our state through space, and then we move our uh, covariance through space, and it does its thing, and now it kind of, maybe it rotates some, and it does something, and now it, it has a final, at tk, it has a final, uh, you know, shape, uh, shape, size, orientation, and, and that may have changed, may have grown as a result of your spectral density uh, matrix here. Um, we say, you know, if you increase your process noise, that's basically increasing the volume, uh, so to speak, of this ellipsoid, or that's the way I like to think of it. Um, uh, you, you're increasing the volume of the ellipsoid, 
which in turn kind of increase, oh man, I am dropping frames all over the place, aren't I? I gotta stop this. Was that it? That was it, wasn't it? No, oh, you know what I'm gonna do then? How, how long, how bad was that for, how long was that? Can I not just have two things open? Okay. So, uh, getting away from the, the uh, equations, which I should have written down. Actually, you know what? i got to pull that up. We're going to have to run late. I'm sorry if you had something to do after this. Um, where was I? Okay. All right. I only just now looked at the frame rate or the frame drops thing and saw it was dropping like crazy. Okay. So I want to come back to here. I don't know why that was doing that. So. All right. So we, we've propagated our state from time TK minus one to TK, and I'm, I'm, I'm hawkeyeing the frame rate drop here. Um, so now we wanna update. So now we're over here, and now we wanna take our measurements. So here's our, here's our antenna, and it's gonna take a measurement of our guy, right? And so we wanna update. And so this is kinda of have this a little backwards. Um, so we have our uh, covariance, and so this uh, P sub K bar K minus one is uh, the covariance that you have, basically this ending covariance. And the reason it's called K bar K minus one is, um, is that it is it's at time K, um, but you've propagated it from K minus one. You have not ingested any new information yet. And so what we're trying to get is this P K bar K. And what that means is, you know, your post, that is your post updated uh, covariance um, that brings in the information from your uh, measurement, and so the way that the way that occurs is through uh, basically um, an innovation, and so the innovation is kind of, or an innovation. I guess they call it. Yeah, there's multiple things you can call it. The update, the innovation, and the Kalman update is basically the update to your state and covariance as a result of the measurement. And so, you know, I've kept saying earlier, the measurement, you know, only has uh, observability. They say, they call it observability or sensitivity uh, in certain axes. For our guy right here, if we're taking a range measurement, uh, you can tell that its axis of uh, sensitivity is going to be, um, I guess, in line with its, with its direction between uh, the, the spaceship, your spaceship and, and the antenna itself. So um, this H matrix right here, is another uh, Jacobian, where instead of taking the uh, partial derivative of your um, force function um, in all your state space, across your state space, you're uh, taking the, the partial derivative of your uh, measurement model across your state space. And so this is how you tease out, um, this is how you tease out your sensitivities of your measurements in each direction, is through this, uh, this measurement Jacobian. And so um, if you have, you know, we call this your measurement partials, the partial derivatives. Um, if you have a, a measurement model, that means that you have the model in which, like, I take the model and say um, it takes its signal, it, it bounces a signal there and back, and it gives me a range. And that's, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's one, uh, you know, that, that's one aspect of the measurement model, but the other aspect is, are the measurement partials. And so that means how does the measurement change if the state changes in any direction. And so this is the Kalman update. Um, you're basically taking your, uh, your covariance and, and uh, you're, you're merging. Uh, there's a big inverse right here. So you can also think of this, I can also draw this out right here as K equals uh, pH transposed over uh, P, H, P, H plus R. Transpose plus R. And so what we're doing here with this guy is we're, take, we're taking our covariance. 
I'm sorry, I didn't mean to circle that one in red. Uh, we're taking our covariance, which is our, you know, basically which models our uncertainty in, um, in our state space, um, and we're rotating it. Uh, we rotate it into the model space, oh, I'm sorry, the measurement space. And then from there, um, we divide it by the, the innovation, or I'm sorry, we, we create the uh, Palman gain uh, by dividing um, by this rotation plus this R. And where this R is the spectral density from earlier, you may remember, uh, this, the R is your measurement noise. And so this kind of bounds um, how big your Kalman update can be um, as a result of, uh, how big your Kalman gain can be as a result of your measurement noise. So um, if you have a very large measurement noise, um, you can see here that would make the denominator big and this would make your Kalman gain small. And so, um, so essentially this Kalman gain goes into this update equation, the next equation where you take your uh, final state, this is x at tk bar k minus one. Oh, that's just tk. This is x hat k bar k minus one. Um, so you take your new updated estimate is going to be your old estimate plus the gain times this measurement uh, residual, which is the, the z sub k is the value, the actual real value of your measurement at TK. So we're gonna call that this range measurement, right? Minus your model of the, uh, your, your estimated measurement at, uh, your estimated state at time TK. So we have, let me do this. So we have a rate, or this, this range actually you can see that it's going to this green guy. This is our estimated guy. So this is actually our estimated range. Our real range, what really happened is we went to this guy because that, that was the real measurement. So that's your range. So that's the difference between this green guy that went to the real spacecraft is your range, the Z sub K, and then the H of X hat of K, K minus one would be this red guy, what you thought your measurement would be based on where you thought you would be, based on where you came, where you thought you came from and all that fun stuff. And so this residual multiplied by the Kalman gain plus, it is then added to the state, your, your green state to create, you synthesize and create, I'm now creating this colored in red block who is at the same time, but he's the new x hat of k at k. At time k uh, with information at time k, as known at time k. And so by doing that, we've updated our state. We've actually moved our uh, estimate, estimated state. Not moved it forward in time, it's the same time. We've updated it, it's the same time. And then uh, similarly, um, with our Kalman gain, we update our uh, covariance. And so we have this ellipsoid here, right? We took a range measurement. Of course, now we've, it's centered about our new updated guy. But, you know, because our range measurement is uh, in one direction only, it kind of takes our covariance and squishes it because uh, it has better sensitivity in that direction, so it knows really well. You now know really well in that direction, uh, or at least better than you did, um, where you are within that space. So it is more likely that your errors are going to be along this axis than this axis. Does that make sense? It's more likely that because you just took a range measurement, that your error is not going to be in the direction of that range measurement. It's more likely now that your that your error is going to be orthogonal to that range measure is one direction. But you do this from multiple directions. You do this over time. Um, over time, you can create a better state estimate. And so um, that actually brings us right to two o'clock. I did not even get to where are we at. Um, frame drops. Only a few more. Um, so that, that was a fire hose of the extended Kalman filter. And I wanted to do that like five more times because it was never explained to me in that 
fashion that when I got into school, it was just derived immediately. And so um, I, I, I did not like that. I, I, like, I like explaining it like this. Um, so, you know what, I'm going to give a, a few more minutes just because um, I started late. Um, the unscented Kalman filter um, does, I'm not even going to look it up, but let's go back to, oops, let's go back to these equations, right? Remember how I said we have a covariance that we kind of, we start, um, let me erase all this. We, uh, we had a covariance that we kind of estimate as a kind of uh, ellipsoid um, that, that is kind of Gaussian in every direction. Um, and so we call that the, the, the covariance. But instead of actually kind of like predefining this covariance as and, and binding it, bounding it to uh, this guy, uh, one thing we can do is instead, and they call this, um, I don't know if, if it's two words of the same uh, thing, if there's slight differences, but we call them sigma points. And so if you have your uh, you have your truth, right? I'm going to call that the black box. There's your truth. You have your estimate. There's your estimate. But uh, instead of having a kind of predefined, you know, my uncertainty is bound by some kind of ellipsoid that's blah, 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 blah. Instead, we're going to also carry along these stars these stars, and they're called sigma points. And so uh, we, we toss both our truth and our estimate through the same f of, you know, f of x and u, call it f. But also, instead of that, um, all this fun stuff, uh, the fp plus pfq, um, we're just gonna toss our sigma points through the same through the same thing. And so we'll end up with our box here. And now let's say our sigma points have kind of changed shape as a result as a result of propagating from TK minus one, we're going to K minus one to K. Um, you can see that that's changed. And so um, you, can, you, you can do your updates directly on these guys, or you can take uh, these guys and um, with their geometry, uh, redefine a, a covariance. So instead of, um, instead of taking the assumption with you through the propagation, you can uh, kind of create these sigma points, throw them through the same nonlinear, uh, nonlinear function, um, and then and then get a covariance at the end. Um, it's more computationally intense. Um, it it however can be better for um, I guess I, I only just now mentioned it linearization. And so what does that mean? Um, I I breezed over it. And that's going to be the very last thing I talk about. And we're just going to have to have another another one of these. Um, um, earlier I, I we showed these uh, Jacobians here where you take the partial derivative of uh, your, your state space function, you know, as you orbit around the Earth, um, well, you have to take that, that, uh, that derivative um, at a certain time. So you see the x hat of t, u of t, um, that happens at a certain time. And so what that means is that, like, so for example, um, what this, what a Jacobian basically means, if you under, it, it's, it's, it's a, a calculus stuff, right? Um, you, you know what a derivative is in so far as You've got a function, and uh, you take its derivative at some point. I really got to just use black. You take its derivative. You take its derivative, and that derivative is a tangent, right? Uh, you expand that to three dimensions. That tangent line becomes a plane, um, and then this plane is effectively this plane at this point can be defined as a, a kind of Jacobian of this, the Jacobian of this hill at that point is this plane. And of course, what, what happened here is we created this plane, which is a straight line at that point. 
you go off that you go off that point and this plane changes. You go off that point by just a little bit. Now the plane's over here, right? So what if, what if, what just happened there is that we linearized the problem around the estimated state that we have. And so that can be fine in most cases or it can be bad in some cases. And so uh, linearization is something we do um, to make things work um, uh, so that things will work together in linear algebra. Um, but, you know, it can break down, it creates assumptions that can break down and kind of defining what that, what those assumptions mean, where those assumptions break down uh, can change depending on what the problem is. Okay, let's go back. So the things I did not get to, I'm just not going to get to. Um, navigation operations. Uh, what is truth? What is accuracy? Uh, some other topics that are inter intersecting or tangential to space navigation. I kind of hinted at it earlier with optical navigation, computer vision, and machine learning. Uh, computer vision is, is a, more involved than just um, optical navigation. Um, computer vision is, is um, well, I don't want to get into it. We're out of time. I'm going to have to save this for next time. Um, machine learning can obviously, uh, as you uh, can maybe imagine looking at some of this stuff, um, you can use machine learning in various ways to uh, better optimize your navigation solutions. And so I always like to end with a pick me slide. Um, I wanted to plug something philanthropic to appear nice and good. And so today it's abortioncarenetwork.org slash donate. Um, if you're here and you're still listening, go there and donate. I'm going to go do that right after this. Um, so next topic, we're going to do orbits redux. And then I think I'm just going to have to come back to navigation because we didn't really get to everything that I wanted to. And I think towards the end, I, I started to, to speed up there. So um, thanks, guys. Thanks again. Um, I don't know when I'm going to do this again. Maybe in a week. I, I may, I may hit, hit the pause until... Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I may hit the pause until Christmas. I don't know. We'll see. Um, stay tuned. Thank you. Love you. Bye.